is the coolest show brought to you by Hip Hop Caucuses. Think 100%. It's the coolest show you know. Keep the culture connected. It's the coolest show you know. In your ear, yeah, respect the expert level information, entertainment, education. Rev here, we got you covered as you hit your destination. Climate rules everything around me. Cream. For those who lost focus, close your eyes and just dream. Open your third eye, now the world is your off. Coolest, coolest show you know. It's the hip hop call. Hi everyone, welcome to The Coolest Show, and I am Tamara Tolzo Laughlin, sitting in for Rev Yearwood. I have the pleasure today to interview Michelle Maka, who is an organizer, strategist, and educator uh, of, from South Africa, who is gonna connect with us today about everything we should know about what's going on in climate and environment from that perspective. Hi, Michelle, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Tamara. How are you? Glad to have you here today. I'm gonna to ask you a few questions. Uh, and let's start with the basics. Who are you and who is your community? Wow, talk about basic. Um, who am I? <laughs> I am, I'm a regular girl from the Southern part of Africa. Um, I am from Zimbabwe, that's where I was born. And I lived there for about half of my life before I moved to South Africa where I did my schooling uh, and then eventually picked up activism uh, for many different reasons that I'm sure we'll get to explore. And right now I'm currently pursuing computer science and applied mathematics. I've got a very strong passion for the STEM field. Uh, and for me, STEM is science, technology, engineering, environmentalism, and math. <laughs> <laughs> so I also... Um, uh, working with an organization called the African Climate Alliance uh, on climate justice issues. And I've got a lot of different passions, including fighting period poverty, uh, making sure that education is accessible, and really just allowing people, even the average quote unquote people, to sort of flourish in whatever they do. So that's a little bit about me. Fantastic. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about the African Climate Alliance. Uh, what is the African Climate Alliance and who does it serve? Just so our audience gets an understanding of the context of your work. Sure. So the African Climate Alliance is a youth based organization or movement. It's a youth based movement based organization um, mm -hmm. that serves youth and uh, people of African descent or people in Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. And we do a lot of climate organizing. We are working in the education space in terms of trying to make sure that climate resources are available and digestible for just about anybody. Uh, we also get involved in advocacy work, uh, including adaptation. We do, we have mitigation efforts. And currently our base is a lot of youth between the ages of 18 to 35. However, we do have a supporter sort of group and that is anyone who's older than that. Uh, I'm gonna ask, how do the 35 year olds feel about being described as youth? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> They're through. Um, <laughs> it might be some of the last time you hear it. So just wanted to ask for context. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Um, so youth in South Africa, youth is anybody between 18 and 35. Uh, and I think that just to also ask, answer the second question about who my community is, uh, my community is Black people. Mm, full stop? Yes. And anybody I don't want to support, but Black people. Fantastic. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you started to discuss where your work fits. Can you talk about climate action in the context of the community that you serve, of the African Climate Alliance? There are other forms of alliance across Africa. I'm sure 55 countries have a lot to talk about, but it's really important for us to think about what are the climate issues that your work is focused on and what makes them climate? Right. So I think one of the problems that we're currently seeing or that we've seen from mainstream climate activism movement is that it aims to separate climate activism with everything else. And I am seeing all these intersectionalities and it's actually very, very difficult. It is virtually impossible for you to separate climate issues with other issues like social issues and um, mm -hmm. other such things. So my work is centered around people really. So 
there is one great misconception if you come this side of the world where you would find that uh, the regular people so in south africa 80 percent of the population is black and brown folk uh which are the regular exactly. people who don't you know care about climate change which is completely wrong it's just they're not exposed to it and so when you get into these communities and you raise this issue and you say this is the problem and these are the ways we can you know solve them you find that even the attitude sort of changes right uh, so that is the context of my work it aims to ensure that everybody or at least everyone that i'm in contact with is exposed to the current issues while also taking away that climate issues are not um, isolated they don't exist in a silo and mm -hmm. then also looking at how we can solve that or how we empower people because i do believe that empowerment is the greatest part of allowing somebody to partake in the climate activism movement. And so that's what I do. It could be through education. I, I sometimes volunteer my time to ensure that, you know, people can do well at school and even grow in love for school. And that literally directly affects uh, how they engage with the climate space. I hear you lifting up some things that are pretty similar to dynamics we have here in the States where uh, the imagery and the perception of who cares about climate has much more to do with whether folks use the popular lang language, uh, the lingo and terminology, whether or not you see them doing activities that are deemed to be climate focused or not. Is that what you're talking about when you um, focus on why education is important and bringing in quote unquote regular people. Uh, what do regular people do about climate that, that you connect with? They exist. Uh, <laughs> I'm a regular person myself. And um, I think the one thing literally that regular people do that makes me connect to them is the fact that they are regular. Um, a lot of my work also focuses on decolonizing a lot of these spaces. So when I speak about education in this context, as well as my work, it's also rooted in decolonization. And so I always look at what we were before colonialism, who we were, how we interacted with the environment. And it's a thing of getting back to that and not being introduced to this new concept. And I always say, like my grandparents, they lived sustainability and i never knew it was sustainability I, until i came to south africa where i became aware of a lot of different things including my skin color because zimbabwe is like majority black as in mm -hmm. 90 something percent black folk so you cannot know that you're black until somebody says hey you're actually black um so that's what regular people do that makes me sort of connect with them the fact that they exist and they've got such a great relationship i think and a great respect for even the environment you can see through the ceremonies um or even the languaging you know one example is there's a term called ubuntu and this is across a lot of the uh, bantu languages so that's swahili a lot of uh, indigenous languages it, it has different translations and variations but ubuntu simply means uh, humanity it means i am because you are and mm -hmm. in that case, I think that's really beautiful and they live it. And because of that, I connect to regular folk. Well, I, I would tell you, it's powerful everywhere. If you're listening to this, uh, you're already connected in this conversation through Ubuntu. So I think it's really just a beautiful way of thinking about the siloing that the work of environment is compared to how people live their lives in the environment. Fantastic. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more. So here at The Coolest Show, we think a lot about culture, about how we interact in it and how it creates the conditions uh, that give us the power or diminish the power that we have to operate outside of our community. Um, how do you see culture in connection to struggles for human and environmental rights? And what a, you actually started to talk about it a little bit in terms of the language and how people see each other and the behaviors of our um, recent ancestors, not just our long and distant ancestors. Talk to us a little bit more about culture, human and environmental rights in your work. I think culture has a lot of influence in the ways that people interact with uh, a lot of these different concepts like climate activism. Um, you know, recently I was a co-facilitator for an environmental education workshop. And here we aim to break down what environmental education was and also give people necessary tools to be able to replicate what we're doing and even make it better. So it meant that exposing people to these issues. And one key thing uh, that we try to emphasize was when you're introducing issues of climate 
change, climate activism, environmentalism, you don't introduce it as a climate crisis because a lot of these people have a lot of different things that they're having to focus on. So it becomes far removed. But if you introduce it as gardening and how that affects uh, your ability to put food on the table and how picking a single piece of plastic and making eco bricks is a great change because then you're living in a cleaner environment. You find that people are a lot more receptive because they can connect. And what I find is there's a massive cultural barrier that comes with the languaging used in this space. Uh, example right now is right now we're using English and it's allowing us to connect, but okay. it's also causing a greater divide to all of the people who don't understand English, which is possibly 50% of the population globally. So when I look at these things, we look at, I want to explore how things like that affect and influence culture. You'll find that there's a great movement right now of people who are quote unquote, going back to the roots. So they've taken up mm -hmm. hiking again, um, connecting back to the idea of being one with nature, which would mm -hmm. mean that, you know, climate activism in a sense, ceases to exist to them. Because how I sort of see climate activism is it's a bit to connect us back to the environment, thereby causing us to care about the environment, meaning then we can care and take care of this thing that we care about. But culturally speaking, the environment has always been a part of uh, Black folk. We can take it to uh, far back ancestors and even the recent ones just before colonialism and apartheid and other such things. You find that there was a great relationship with the environment. People were hunter gatherers. We can't hunt or gather anything right now in the midst of this concrete jungle. We are literally removed from our natural sort of um, habitat. And I think the culture in that sense, because I think there are many similarities in culture across the African continent. Um, mm -hmm. And one massive one is the ability to get back into the greenery, the forests, and feel like your home, in a sense. So those are some of the things that I'm always trying to explore and how, you know, in conversation, one thing that I've learned is when you approach such conversations, you don't approach it from a, I'm a climate activist, I care about the environment, and so you should too. You approach it from a, let's talk about the environment. How do you feel about it? What does it do? How does it serve you? And you find that a lot of people are actually quite distressed about the current state of the environment. And they don't know that it's an environmental issue or a crisis. So it's not that they're not aware. They're just not aware of the languaging and that causes a big barrier. So I, I, I hope that answers that. <laughs> no, I, I'm hearing some really similar uh, notes from the activists across the diaspora here in the U.S. have also raised that the question is not whether our communities, uh, Black people, care about the environment. It's whether we care about talking about it in ways that get funded, in ways that are seen as programmatic, in ways um, that can be siloed and broken up into annual uh, metrics for how work happens. All of these things are happening at the same time. And so the question is, are we measuring the culture or is the culture um, bigger than than the work itself? And I think it's pretty easy to to say that the culture is paramount, which is why we spend so much time thinking about it here on the pod. Um, I I really would like you to help us understand your work. You talked a little bit about um, the barrier of language, about connecting with people and the need to be outside, about urbanization. That's what I hear when you talk about uh, the concrete jungle. I'm from New York, which is the concrete jungle for sure. Uh, but but I, I'll flag that um, we built the city out of country. So what does it mean? What is the struggle against? Is the education a struggle against people having the right language? Is the struggle for a return to um, the use and utility of the environment in every form? Like what is the struggle against what is a win and how do you make that happen in the context of the African Climate Alliance? The struggle is against colonialism. Say more uh, about that. And colonialism comes with or came with and still has a lot of these uh, different 
problems, right, that we're still trying to f find solutions to. One being, um, in the context of South Africa, um, apartheid introduced the Bantu Education Act. And that meant black folk would have a lesser quality or lesser access to, uh, they would have access to lesser quality of education. The education they would be receiving would allow them to be house girls and garden boys and other such things, while their counterparts received really good education and went on to participate into this economy and even build uh, the economy and amass wealth or make bigger the world that they had inherited from um, the systems that were set up to sort of benefit them. And so that we haven't moved away from. We haven't moved away from the fact that currently black people still do not have access to education or they don't have as much ac access to education. Education in South Africa, and I think anywhere, costs quite a bit. You mm -hmm. take that and you give it to people who live majority in what I can only describe as teen foil houses because it's zinc mm -hmm. structures, it's four zinc structures and a makeshift roof a lot of the times. And that person is living in poverty, impoverished. They don't have access. There's a cycle that keeps them in this space where they cannot think anything other than survival. And so when you look at education from an empowerment perspective or a reskilling yeah. or upskilling perspective, you're giving somebody uh, a choice for them to step into a space where they're able to think about things other than the poverty, other than the hunger, mm -hmm. other than the in access to a lot of things, right? Or the lack of access to a lot of things. You're looking at education as a means to give a person power to change their circumstance. I speak a lot about mathematics and technology because I do think and I do believe that that's where uh, some of that empowerment can come from. It can mean that somebody has spent six months right, best case scenario, six months learning tech skills. Uh, they're able to get a really high paying job, but because of their experiences, a lot of the times we see this a lot. And I can only speak about black folk because that has been my experience. Yeah. Black folk are very community minded, Ubuntu, right? I am because you are. The education or these opportunities or this change and shift in mindset allows a person to think beyond their current situation. So you find that people who come out of these situations go back to expose some other people to the same sort of opportunities that they would have got. So education in that sense, uh, for me, it's a well-rounded issue. It speaks to environmental education. So it sort of explores how we connect to the environment but not in a way where we should be connecting to the environment more like how do you feel we connect to the environment so it's very collaborative it's decentralized yeah. um true to decolonizing sort of fashion because colonialism centered a lot of things centered resources uh, and other such things so education in that sense is the only way i view it and also the way that i apply it even in my work where I don't view it as, you know, me having an upper hand. It's more, mm -hmm. me, I think it allows me to understand different contexts because I don't live in some of those circumstances. So I cannot design an education pack and go, hey, by the way, here you go. Uh, thanks, bye. Mm -hmm. uh, it only makes sense for me to create systems that are not only collaborative, but allow people to sort of assimilate into it. Now that relates to the work at the African Climate Alliance is... Um, we aim to have pan-African messaging. That means in as much as we use English, a lot of the times we try to make sure that it's very basic. So that when I say something, you understand it. And it doesn't matter what level of English you sort of have because the country has 11 official languages. We cannot serve everybody if we stick to English. So we've started translating some of our work into the local languages. And that's getting mm -hmm. such a positive response because people can finally connect. People can see themselves in the struggle. And that's what you aim to do, right? So you find that even through all of these systems that you create, you're actively fighting against colonialism. You're fighting against uh, centralization of resources. You're fighting against mm -hmm. identity politics. You are literally having to tell a person sometimes that, look, 
you're worthy, you deserve to be in those rooms, you really are great. And the moment that somebody starts to believe that again, because I think we forget it, just as generational trauma is passed on, there's generational amnesia that's passed on. And the moment somebody <laughs> connects back to who they are and who they're really meant to be, you really see a difference, even in the way that they sort of interact with themselves. Um, I'm hearing so- a little bit, I'm hearing a little bit of, um, of joy in your voice when you talk about what it means to help people reconnect to themselves. Uh, I am curious about uh, how education creates some space for that because your focus on environment and on, on applied mathematics are about leveling the playing field with a lot of data. Right. So so that's pretty data intensive. Um, that translates pretty often to storytelling because storytelling is the oldest form of data. Like we pass it on to make sure other folks know how to stay alive in the form of stories. Uh, is that a focus of your work and how you connect people to their already existing right to the environment? I think what my work allows me to do is create an environment where I facilitate. Um, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily look at myself as an educator. I think more facilitator is what I am. Uh, because, Can you explain the difference? Of course. So traditionally, an educator has been somebody who stands in front of a whiteboard, teaches you a concept, mm-hmm. you take it, and maybe you apply it, maybe you don't. That's up to you. A facilitator decentralizes that process. Um, I do it even in high schools, right? That's where some of my work is as well with the maths and the science. In high schools, I'm a facilitator. I say, hey, Mm -hmm. look, here's a concept. We need to understand it. We need to understand it. That in itself allows me to connect with the students. Even though I might understand this concept, I'm not supposed to uh, have this power over them. They're not supposed to look at me as this mystical creature that knows all maths, right? So (laughs) in facilitating facilitating those spaces and encouraging uh, people to explore by themselves, you find that there's a stark difference between um, traditional education and the Mm -hmm. way that I view and interact and use education as a tool. So I guess... What I realized or what I'm realizing is that a lot of people have a lot of stored memory. They have a lot of stored education, right? And the Mm -hmm. moment you create a great sort of environment to collaborate and share those ideas, you find that you you destabilize the system. Uh, One Mm -hmm. other example is um, uh, where I facilitate the learning in a more traditional sense, like school, maths and science, uh, we had two learners who would come in just to observe and to see if it was for them. And because they were in a traditional school system where they have to be at school for eight hours and other such things, they got out, they were only there for an hour and they sent like messages. Oh, we are so in love with teacher Michelle. She's great because she makes us feel empowered and they're not even part of our school yet. So it really is Mm -hmm. for me, like the difference between facilitating and traditional educator sort of role. Uh, And I don't subscribe to the traditional educator role. It sounds a lot like uh, you'd be at home in so many parts of the movement here in the U.S. where uh, often the answer is uh, we don't need to be spoken to about the issues, but our experience and expertise should become a part of the larger conversation. So I'm seeing some real parallels here across the way the work happens. Similarly, we spend a lot of time in adversarial um, education, re-entry, and support for communities that are struggling against coal, oil, and gas, uh, in, in not just uh, in its natural form or in its unnatural use or in its extraction, but in the ways that it influences everything else. Uh, what are you seeing as the top issues facing the many countries and regions in the continent and your work? I think I would be best suited speaking to a South African context uh, because that is the context Mm -hmm. in which I work and exist. Um, But I think one really big problem that is facing a lot of the communities and especially in South Africa is coal, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. coal, coal, oil and gas is very problematic. Um, I guess a lot of the people in power have been able to keep coal the major source of energy from a point of 
it allows us to develop economically. So we cannot just get rid mm. of it. But it's causing so much, so much more harm to the people who are having to live in what we're terming uh, core affected areas. Um, mm. Can you describe that for us. So uh, there are these communities that are set up close to the mine because a lot of the workers have to get to work um, quite easily. Um, it doesn't really speak to whether or not their quality of life changes or becomes better. In fact, it becomes worse because the mm -hmm. moment you set up a community close to a mining, um, a coal mining spot, you are forced to then start in inhaling all these toxic gases, mm -hmm. uh, this toxic waste that's put in the uh, water bodies around to an extent where one of my colleagues who had gone to one of these um, mining affected communities was talking about a lot of the women cannot uh, wash up because the water is so toxic. Mm. So then you start looking at it like that. Um, and I think it's between Tanzania and uh, Uganda where there is potential to develop uh, another fossil fuel line running mm. through the countries. And so many people, I think about 9,000 people, I, I, I speak under correction, were forcibly moved from this area to make space for this new pipeline. And that is affecting so many communities um, across the three countries, South Africa, Uganda, and Tanzania. But also I know that a lot of other countries are facing the same sort of issue, where even by starting the conversation around phasing out coal and other fossil fuels as the primary source of energy, you are met with a lot of um, resistance from government, from those in power, to the mm -hmm. point where some people have been losing their lives. There's one activist you would be able to find, um, um, Mam Manchangase. She was assassinated a couple of months ago uh, because she stood up against this massive coal project. And, you know, the community feels that loss. I never personally met her. I feel that loss. And that those are just ways in which, you know, we can see that we are, we are operating in an inhumane way. Capitalism has mm -hmm. never served the people. It has served some people. And that is something I think that a lot of people are realizing. A lot of people are trying to shift from, um, but because we don't have money as a mm -hmm. tool of power, we're often then oppressed, even in speaking about these things. Threats are very mm -hmm. easily given out. Lives are very easily taken because it directly affects somebody's pocket. So people are being affected, I think, in varying ways. Uh, and more especially, I think coal is one that affects directly people from core affected mining areas. Uh, and then other such things then contribute to all of these. South Africa has been named the most unequal society in the world. That for me only screamed, we have not moved away from colonialism. We have not moved away from apartheid. Actually, uh, if you drive in Cape Town, it's actually very, very scary that you can see the apartheid Yes, like on this one side, you know, have physically, all these, you can physically see it. see it. You can feel it as well. Um, and that in itself is a challenge because people are not then able to fully exist as themselves if they're having to fight poverty, um, if they're having to deal mentally with the effects of poverty. So I think really there are a lot of problems uh, that we have, but I think coal is one. Um, the African Climate Alliance, together with other organizations, are actually taking the government to court to take to phase out the coal that they had proposed in uh, the energy framework for I think the next five years. And mm -hmm. we know that's inhumane. We know that's detrimental to the environment, to the people, and it's not going to work. So we've, we are take, we're in the process of uh, taking the government to court in that regard. Um, and yeah, we also understand the risks that come with that, but we, we can't sit back and just watch. 
You've talked about some issues that are really familiar to our listening audience. Uh, uh, many conversations uh, we have discussed uh, sacrifice zones or the areas right around where something that is polluting your community that you are not asked to come in that might become a source of your employment also becomes the thing that signs your your um, your uh, autopsy when you die. You know, like you ha you shouldn't have a job that shortens your livelihood. You shouldn't have a job that makes it hard for the air you breathe to be safe for you. You shouldn't have a job uh, that pollutes the water. And I'm hearing so many alignments and similarities across issues around communities having to fight and some of the advocacy pieces, taking uh, your government to court <laughs> to, to lift up the idea that its job is to protect the citizens not to form alliances with industry. Um, can you talk to us about other issues that you are seeing and facing and building solutions for? I know many of us uh, in the listening audience are reeling from the latest IPC assessment, not because it said a lot of things that were new, but because it said things that we have been complaining about, uh, making demands about recommendations to end uh, coal, oil, and gas and fossil fuels. Can you talk to us about the other issues that are also showing up in your context and how uh, these kinds of assessments or multinational conversations about climate help or maybe don't help? I think a lot of my work is set in a context that has, unfortunately, that is under such a stronghold of poverty. So in that way, you start finding that uh, apart from the lack of access to resources, you also have food insecurity as being the number one motivator or unmotivator for people. You have to realize that before people can care about, which is why I mentioned earlier, you don't start talking about the climate crisis as a climate crisis. Why should I care when I don't have food on my table, right? And so yeah. you find that food insecurity is one of the biggest sort of issues and maybe even the biggest challenge. Um, because I don't think you can engage uh, beyond the immediate challenges with a person who is having to fight off poverty and even insecurity in terms of food. So I, I think that's one. Um, mm -hmm. Food insecurity. But, yeah, food insecurity, definitely. And uh, how part of my work is attempting to address this uh, under the African Climate Alliances, we've got an adaptation program. And what that aims to do is create resources around adapting. Um, so it could be creating food gardens, it could be understanding uh, the food sort of system. So things like uh, mm. seed swapping and sustainable um, urban farming and other such things. So the whole sort of umbrella um, is, is something that we are exploring and even partnering with some organizations to make this as accessible as possible. Um, and that directly speaks to food insecurity, but also the need to adapt, uh, I think is highlighted mm -hmm. in the IPCC report, where adaptation is becoming one core part of the crisis. Like people need to learn how to adapt. Um, it's not the only solution, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, I believe you do a bit of work related to gender and some of these issues. Can you talk to us a little bit about how gender is yet another lens to which we should be looking at issues of climate and how you focus on that in South Africa and, and maybe some lessons we can take back with us from this conversation? Absolutely. So I am... Um... It was in 2018, I believe, uh, where I started reacting to disposable menstrual products. Can you say that again for the audience? Disposable menstrual products. Menstrual products. Um, okay, thank you. Just wanna make sure. Uh, some of that work happens here as period equity, but tell us a little bit more about your context. Right, so we, we, we are under the idea of hashtag end period poverty. Uh, it is mm -hmm. the same thing. I think it's just different wording. So, so <laughs> uh, that's where I got exposed to this idea of uh, sustainable menstruation, which I found very fascinating. 
um, people who are using cloth as an alternative, people who are using cups as an alternative, which I was very intimidated by until recently. Um, I'm, I'm, I am so pleased to announce that I finally figured out how a menstrual cup works. Um, <laughs> so yay me, uh, many, many years after I learned about it. So this is when I learned about uh, alternative ways to menstruate. And I started looking into it. So I made myself some uh, pads and then I realized how first expensive. For me, menstrual products, disposable menstrual products had not always been that expensive. The moment I made my own, I started realizing how much I was actually saving, that it's something I'd been using, I think, ever since I'd started menstruating. Um, so it just became an integral part of my life. It wasn't something I had to think about. I didn't think about uh, being able to afford because fortunately I could afford. But and that I mean, includes- just, to, just to ask, and you're talking about manufacturing uh, your own menstrual pads to respond to menstruation and monthly cycle. Yes. Okay. I am. Um, yeah, so I, that, that's what I did. I made, uh, quite a few, I think I made 11 because I was like, I don't want to run out. Uh, but I, I think I was still under the disposable mentality, uh, because I think only now I use like five per cycle or something because they're washable, they're reusable, and I've been using them ever since I made them. Uh, but that's when I got into the space where there was a lot of talk around period poverty and how people were unable to afford. I started conversation with my mom. My mom was like, you know, growing up, we used to use cloth. And I was so fascinated by why they had moved away from it. And it was around, you know, the idea of poor people use that. So disposable products sort of became this great thing and even a measure of access. Um, And I started exploring that. I started hearing these beautiful stories about my grandmother, um, who's always been good with her hands, mind you. She's, she sews, she does a lot of really awesome stuff. And I started exploring it. And through ju- that journey, I learned a lot about how about one in 10 girls across Africa is unable to attend school for the duration of their menstrual cycle. Uh, okay. A, because they cannot afford menstrual products. And... Which, which then affects their ability to be in space with other folks. Is that cultural or is that literally just about being able to be in the same room as other folks? It's literally about being, for me, I think, about being in the same room or being able to be in the same room with other people. Um, because you find that those who do have access menstruate and socialize or collaborate or are in the same rooms as other people. Uh, I think there is a an idea around like culture, they, there are cultural ideas that sometimes impact a person's ability to interact with the next person, but I don't think they're that great to um, stop a person from going to school, right? And so mm-hmm. when I started exploring that, I think I came across really harrowing evidence where people were using things like cow dung to plug their flow so that they could get to school uh, because wow. there was no any other way for them to manage it. Other people were using socks. Other people were using newspapers as a plug. So for me, because I could not put my head around it, uh, I spent quite some time trying to understand the context, speaking to people and finding out if this was just an internet thing. And I can tell you now for free that the reality on the ground is much worse. Okay. And that's so where the climate might my focus on the increased use of plastics from disposability, your research uncovered the reasons why folks are taking these other roads, uh, using products that are really unsafe. Exactly. Uh, because I think okay. for me, I was more interested in it from a sustainability uh perspective i wanted to be more green i wanted to have a green <laughs> menstrual time it was going to be great what um, is a green menstrual time i'm just curious <laughs> like what is that not to you but like in the in the world of environment what does it mean to have a green period <laughs> as far as far as i know it's an entirely different color but i but i but i understand no. the idea <laughs> of uh of take of of taking your carbon footprint to the next yeah. level even when you're having your period oh, 
it would have been great <laughs> if my flow changed color. It would have been. But unfortunately, it didn't. It just meant that I wasn't using disposable products to manage my flow. And that's what a green uh, menstrual time was all about. So through all of this, I realized that there was a much bigger problem and a much bigger discussion to be had around access to things and how that literally affects uh, women and their ability to communicate, their ability to collaborate, their ability to contribute meaningfully in certain spaces. Because if she's not there, she cannot meaningfully contribute. So that meant That's that even the research that says a lot of uh, more men generally have access to things, it's not just because women are not interested. It's because they, one in 10, are affected like this to, to the point where, you know, some of them one are forced to one in 10 women, one in 10 girls, uh, school-going children, uh, cannot go to school because of a lack of access to menstrual pro products. And that directly affects even the... So if you're looking at it from a country's perspective, you're looking then at the ability of that person uh, to meaningfully interact, meaningfully contribute, finish their education, thereby becoming a number in the space where they're another lawyer, another engineer and other such things. So that direct, directly impacts uh, the number of women we are outputting um, in a lot of these industries. And that link, I feel, a lot of the times is not made. And it then, again, I think speaks back to what I do in education and empowering and allowing uh, more people to go into the space. So I this might be my bias, but I am very much under the impression that if you give a woman something, she is able to do wonders with it. So if you give a woman an idea, she can uh, rally up a community and they can go behind it. And it speaks to empowering women. If you are able to empower women to take these very important decisions for their own lives, you are able to create sort of like really strong communities because they are guided. Um, and the value system, I think, even changes when you're exposed to certain rooms and people and um, other such things. So that, I think, in a nutshell, is currently what I'm working on. I'm trying to locally source material. I'm trying to repurpose mm -hmm. material, also talking to uh, textile waste and wanting to redirect that into making these reusable uh, menstrual pads. And maybe in the near future, we might be looking at cups. But I recently discovered, after fighting with one for three days, um, that it's not as accessible as it's made to be on the internet. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hearing from you that um, the... <sighs> Gender issues create issues of accessibility. So not being able to have an interaction with your own body that doesn't exclude you from uh, resources and from conversations and from community means we are losing out on the voices, the intellect and the understanding of an entire part of the population. And so the work that you're doing on period equity uh, is not is not very dissimilar and is in fact entirely tied to uh, community building, resourcing, and the environment, as well as the issues of um, care and repair around not being exposed to toxic products. So it feels an awful lot like the issues that you are focused on are so very tied uh, to those happening in the uh, diaspora experience everywhere. And so Michelle, it has really been uh, incredible to have this conversation with you about the ways that you're approaching environmental issues, about the landscape in South Africa. Uh, I just have one more question for you about Black youth organizing and any thoughts you might want to share with our audience about that uh, before we begin to conclude. So what about Black youth um, organizing? That, that, that is the question. What about it? I don't want to, I, uh, because you're in South Africa, because you are in a context that I don't want to gloss over, tell us what Black youth organizing is in South Africa. Who's doing it? Uh, you already mentioned earlier that the youth uh, are, are, can have gray hair around the sides, whether it uh, 32, 35, 34, you know, so just want to uh, uh, paint us a picture of who is doing Black youth organizing and what are they focused on? 
black youth are doing black youth organizing and they're focusing on a lot of different issues including issues of decolonization and i think when i use the word in the term decolonization i really speak to uh, allowing people to have access which is something that they have not been able to have uh, historically so allowing them to be able to really just exist because i think when you're a black person uh, in any diaspora you find yourself not fully existing to an extent even, even in the context of africa where most people are black just want to flag that so much of our audience lives uh uh an existence where they are not consistently surrounded by a majority population and so really want to pull out that that distinction people yeah. feel invisible even in this context doing environmental work why is that I think because of the way that the professional environmental landscape is set up, um, there's a lot of performative um, theatrics that you have to subscribe to. There's a lot of uh, censorship. There's a lot of taking away from who you are and trying to fit into this little box that allows you to be palatable to a white sort of audience. And that is very problematic and it is stifling for black youth. You're finding that um, a lot of the time, there's one thing that really annoys me is when somebody comes up to me and says, you're so well-spoken. I'm like, um. Uh, un un unfortunately, I would say that that's a global phenomenon. You're so articulate for a person who's dug down deeply to really study a thing that you care about. Isn't right. it shocking how well you talk about your life's work? Uh, so it's good to know that regardless of where we're sitting, we're having mm -hmm. such a similar experience. No, I, can, you, can you say more about um, uh, the performative aspect? So you talk about what we can aptly describe as the white gaze, like what kinds of tactics mm -hmm. meet that criteria and why would black youth in climate need to do that in order to do their work? I think what's happened, and you also look at the pool of funders, I don't think we have enough funders who are people of color. So you would find that because a lot of this wealth is in the hands of white folk, you are having to create an idea for them to trust you with their money. Because I think mm -hmm. it also has a lot to do with like a saviorism complex. If I give this to this person, will they run away with it? So you have mm -hmm. to, and this is what I'm finding a lot, of, you have to create an idea closest to a palatable um, version of yourself as possible that allows you to engage with these people in a quote unquote safe zone uh, might not necessarily be safe for you but it definitely makes the next person you're engaging with somewhat safe because then that way it creates this idea of trust and it also speaks to again decolonization because if we start decolonizing the ideas of professionalism and realize that sometimes even this conversation that we're having um, mm -hmm. with all of the laughing in between and all of the joy that's in between yeah. it is professional and we should not yeah. seek to, to be confined in this little box that says you're only professional if you wear your hair a certain way you're only professional if you speak a certain way I would say to people I actually dislike the fact that I don't have a more like I have a more neutral tone so people find it a little bit difficult to place me like where are you actually from and I'm like well I'm I've, I've been around um and a, a big part of me wished I did this work with a really strong indigenous English accent where I said, ah. you know, um, I don't know, I, I can't really think of something no, right no. now. So, but So just, just yeah. to clarify for our audience, you're talking about being palatable to people external from your experience. Yes, yes. And, and the performative work of Black climate youth in your context means making yourself accessible to people who are not experiencing the harm. Exactly. Okay. Because what you find well, is well. in spaces with people who, so in, in, in spaces where it's majority black folk, again, 11 official languages across South Africa, you are bound right. to come into contact with a lot of different people. That in itself um, is actually a wonder. Because when you are interacting with these people of different cultures and different languages and other such things, you're not having to change yourself because you're interacting with a fellow black person. The moment you step into boardrooms, the moment you're in meetings with these people, you're having to, and this is why I do the work that I do because it's really, really just great. And um, yeah, it'd be really great if you come on board, which is performative in it. So I, I think we can all sort of, uh, um, 
you know, mess around with our tone to become a little bit more familiar. I think a lot of black people are very familiar with that. <laughs> yeah, we here we call it code switching. So right. that folks understand you. It's like you become a, a there's a recent movie, Coda, you become a person who translates across lots of different experiences. I think that also happens in the culture, but that's an entirely different podcast. Uh, I have to say it's been an incredible conversation with you. I think we could go on. There's so many more questions that I have about how your work is happening, your vision of the future. I'm going to end on this last question before we close out. What are you fighting for and how can we support you? Ooh, what am I fighting for? Um, in a nutshell, I think I'm fighting for justice. I fight for gender equity. I fight for uh, racial equity. I fight for justice in all of its glory. Um, the one best way to support, I think one would be to educate yourself around the issues uh, that you're trying to help in. A lot of people then fall under the guise of being a savior, even when they don't want to, because it's what they're exposed to. So to educate yourself around the context and to really just adopt a collaborative mindset. Um, furthermore, I, I, um, I, I think I mentioned extensively the work that I do with the period poverty space. Um, mm -hmm. In the coming months, I hope to have been able to establish um, a base here in South Africa, which is looking like it might not necessarily happen for many different political reasons, including the government just deciding that all foreign nationals must be. Um, so that might impact what I'm able to do in South Africa. However, in the next coming years, this is not something that's going to die just because I live South Africa. Uh, it's something that's going to continue to happen. And I think my fight is not my fight alone. If anybody wants to get involved in the end period poverty fight, they can engage with a lot of different stakeholders across the world, uh, but most, but most specifically in South Africa, um, where a lot of people are needing to have access to a lot of resources to be able to meaningfully participate in a society that was not necessarily built for them. So I think, yeah, that's what I do and that's how people can support. And just want to lift up that when you mentioned foreign nationals, you mean people outside of South Africa. So 55 countries there are who, who are foreign nationals. Uh, we're talking about people going from one country to another to do their work. And I'm hearing from you that the work of, of period poverty and focusing on a woman or a, 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 a female identifying person's ability to menstruate and not be and be included in their in their in their civic, professional, and personal pursuits is a dangerous issue. It has been a real pleasure to be in a conversation with Michelle Maka. I am Tamara Tolls O'Laughlin sitting in for Rev Yearwood on The Coolest Show. It has been a pleasure to talk about people and planets, uh, plastics and periods with Michelle Maka. Thank you so much for coming. This is The Coolest Show brought to you by Hip Hop Caucuses. Think 100%. It's the coolest show, you know, keep the culture connected. It's the coolest show, you know, in your ear, yeah, respect the expert level information, entertainment, education. Rev here, we got you covered as you hit your destination. Climate rules everything around me. Cream. For those who lost focus, close your eyes and just train. Open your third eye, now the world is your off. Coolest, coolest show, you know, it's the hip hop call.